Hello and welcome to Securities Lending Saturday on Sunday. I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel and thanks for joining me. Today we're going to be talking about bilateral versus tri-party collateral. Those are the two big ways the counterparties in this business manage to move the securities back and forth and mobilize them. Each has their own place. We're going to do a little bit of compare and contrast. So if securities lending is your thing, whether you are an intermediary, a borrower or a lender, or just part of the infrastructure that services the community, or heck, you might just be interested in learning more, uh, then this is the place for you. always have a slide deck with me. And of course, this week is no different. So here it is. That's me in the corners. Yeah. As I said today, bilateral versus tri-party collateral. That's the topic. And let's go into it. That's what we're talking about today. That gives you an idea of what we've been covering in the previous 32 weeks. This is week 33. I can't believe it. I can't, I'm always amazed at, at how much there is to talk of week after week. Next week, uh, thanks very much to Amel who suggested, uh, in, how do we increase income for customers? What can market participants do? What can agent lenders do to make more money for their customers? He asked me that question in one of the comments. It's a fantastic question. And I thought rather than just simply answer it there, I'd do it video on it. So that's what we're going to be talking about next week. And I, I'm really looking forward to that because I'd love talking about how to make money without necessarily changing your risk profile for the worse. Obviously there's trade-offs and we'll, we'll get into that. Back to this one. Again, you can always get copies of the slides of this show and previous shows if you sign up at that site. And then one of my, one of my assistants will be sending the uh, material through to you in the coming day. This is part 33, bilateral versus tri-party, the background to the business and how things all started out, the flows of each of the alternative methods, comparison of the two, some observations that were shared with me, which I want to share with you and my own personal outlook for the future of uh, bilateral and tri-party and collateral generally, I think. Now, remember, this is for information and hopefully entertainment uh, purposes only. You always need to speak with a professional before you implement, change, add, delete, amend, or do anything in securities finance and, in fact, anywhere in the financial markets. So always seek professional advice before taking action. That's for the lawyers. Okay. If this video has been helpful to you, if you find this interesting, this one or previous ones, please uh, give us a thumbs up uh, or a like or whatever it is on whichever platform you're on. If you want to see future videos, uh, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. And that way you'll be notified that there are, that there is a new video posted. I, I post at least every Sunday. Um, I'm still trying to find a way to carve out more time to do more videos, but it looks like I'm stuck for the moment with the once a week, but I love sharing information. And remember the objective right now, the key short-term goal is to get to 500 subscribers because when we get to 500 subscribers, YouTube will open up the community channel for me. And that way you can ask questions, you can share your thoughts and views, and I, it can be a much more interactive experience, not just waiting for video days. So, uh, the more subscribers I get, uh, look, we, we had a great, we had a great run. We started last week. Uh, well, great run for me. Remember I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, your typical YouTuber, but we started the 405 at the beginning of last show. And I think we're at 417. So that's 12 in the week for me. That's good. So I'm very thankful for everyone that uh, has subscribed recently, or in fact has been a subscriber all the way along. Okay. Let's just talk about collateral. So before I get into securities lending collateral, I think the important point here is that really securities lending collateralization is only a piece of the business. It's a big piece of the business, but it's only part of it. We also have repo business, which is uh, even bigger than securities lending. And then you have uh, cleared and uncleared uh, derivatives, again, huge and getting bigger. And then you have other collateralized businesses, which for many people, they won't really come across this. 
but there is quite a lot of other activities. I've given one example here, collateralized reinsurance. And that's a big part of it. I, I deal, in fact, I will move my picture out of the way there so that you can actually see what that says. How's that? So collateralized reinsurance, a collateralized reinsurance. So that's when two insurers are dealing with that, with each other. Typically you'll see this when they, you read about buyouts of pension funds where the future obligations of that pension fund will be absorbed by an insurance company who commits to actually making the payments to pensioners. And then what they do is they will uh, reinsure that with other insurers to spread the investment activity and risk therefore, and to cover exposures with each other, there's collateral that moves back and forth. So there's a lot of different businesses that go behind the scenes as well as many structured uh, transactions. So. Uh, security is lending an important part of the business, but by no means is it alone or even the biggest piece of it. Okay. So don't forget that. Okay. Let's get back and focus on securities lending now. And when I started in this business, but things were all done by cash, actually, when I did my first transactions for many years. So I, the first stock loan was 1981. I did quite a lot in uh, 1987, 88. That was all cash collateral. So that was pretty straightforward. You'd move the securities that you were, they were borrowing or lending and the cash moved. But then as you got later in the eighties and particularly in the 1990s, and certainly this century, the securities collateral has become critically important. And we all know that the amount of securities collateral that's used in securities lending transactions is predominantly non-cash collateral, right? So the market is a non-cash collateralized market for the most part, with the exception of the U.S. equity market and corporate bond market, where it's still driven by cash. But I think if market participants in the U.S. had the option, many of them would also expand the extent to which securities are used as collateral if it was an acceptable range of collateral, and that's subject for another video. Securities collateral has been critical. Now, the problem with securities as collateral is the management of it, the intraday management and the overnight management of it. Because if I'm a lender and I have a list of collateral that I'm willing to accept, I'll also have limits as to how much of that I'll accept. I might have a cap on how much exposure I'll have to an equity market or a government bond market of a less liquid government. So still a high quality liquid piece of collateral, but not necessarily from the most liquid market. So I might want to cap things. I do that in the old days, we used to have a, a, a book or a little notebook or a notepad or a guide or a list. You'd, you'd have to record somewhere what your lending counterparties a would accept and B what they had capacity to it because it wasn't always uh, availability. So I want to deliver you some more German equities. You might say, I normally take those German equities, except I'm pretty full up and I don't really want any more. So that's really difficult to keep track of. And you used to scribble it out and go, no, they don't take this before anymore. Or you'd make a notation that say they normally take it as of today's date, they're capped out. So it was really completely unmanageable. And as securities any volumes grew, it became more and more difficult. If we just quickly go through a, a bi bilateral flow, you'll actually see why it's, why it's actually difficult, right? So <clears throat> if you look at this segment here, so in the normal opening leg of the transaction, it's no, no big deal. The, the agent lender that's lending the securities will deliver the securities out and they will, they and the borrower will agree on what the collateralized value of that instrument is or right? So they calculate the value of securities on loan, calculate how much collateral is required. The borrower will know what the lender accepts and that's great. So they'll deliver it to them. So the opening leg is pretty straightforward. Uh, you still have to agree. Do you want, do you, do you have capacity to take this instrument? Do you take this instrument at all? Yes, no. How much of it? And then you actually have to physically move the security. So there's a settlement there from them to the lender and the lender from the borrower. So there's quite a lot of settlement uh, activity, especially if there's a diversified pool of collateral and you want diversification of collateral. So that opening leg is doable, but of course you have the securities that are going out on loan and the top leg, the securities that are coming back as collateral. So there's a lot of settlement activity. 
The next day, though, or any subsequent date, if the borrower determines that they need some of these securities that they delivered, if they need some of them, they have to give other securities. So now you're going through that same process. And the reality is this kind of thing happens day in and day out. So it's a huge amount of settlement activity and quite a lot of volume, a lot of transaction charges, right? A lot of settlement charges, moving securities back and forth between the two counterparties. So it's a pretty cumbersome approach. It's, and there are big parts of the world where tri-party isn't uh, operating and the activity of course is being done on a bilateral basis. So it is doable. It's just not easy. Okay. Before I take the next step, I just want to say hi to Asher. Thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate you putting the comment in. Good to see you again. And if we go to the next, I love it when people uh, join in, please add any questions or comments that you have, even if you're just saying hello. And even if you just tell me where you are watching from, right? Sundays are new to me. So I don't know whether everyone's enjoying a Sunday lunch, if you are in Europe or uh, evening drinks already, if you're in Asia or you're just crawling out of bed on a Sunday morning in North America. Okay. Now with tri-party, right? The strength of all of this is in the setup, right? Because the setup is what really enables the efficiency and the automation, not just on day one, but on an ongoing basis. And so the counterparties, what they do is they agree the collateral parameters that work for the two of them. So it's in that sense, it's no real different to the bilateral side of things. It's just the monitoring and maintenance that's different. So they'll decide what are the asset classes that you'll take from which markets, the diversification and concentration limits that you have within the portfolio, and then any limitations uh, or exclusions from that portfolio. So you can agree a framework of collateral that's acceptable to you, but not just the framework, the limitations, caps, exclusions. Okay, so that's all. The main providers are uh, JP Morgan, Bank of New York Mellon, Euroclear and Clearstream. If you look at other providers, you have SIS, who's a, a big player in the uh, repo world, and BMP Paribas, a new entrance, probably about four years ago, maybe five years ago, trying to make an impact there. Again, one of the advantages that a bank like BMP has is they have a huge domestic network in many places of the world. So they're not reliant on sub custodians, it's within the network. And then the newest entrant is State Street with very much a, a different and forward looking approach. Again, when the newest entrants always have the opportunity to take a snapshot of where the market is, but then build their businesses for the future. And that's what uh, new entrants are, are trying to do. And State Street's a, a great example of that. If you look at the tri-party collateral flow, <clears throat> let me just put all that stuff up. Okay, so now the difference here so in many ways, it's the same. The agent lender still delivers the securities to the borrower. Borrower is still responsible for delivering securities collateral to the lender or its agent. So that side of it works. So in the opening leg, part of it is done. But of course, what happens with tri-party is the tri-party does what it says on the tin. The two entities, the agent or the lender and the borrower, they agree that they're going to outsource the management of the collateral to this tri-party provider and say, we'll agree those parameters we just talked about, and then we'll leave it to the tri-party provider to manage that process. So agent lender, your responsibility is to agree with the borrower how much collateral value needs to be moved from the borrower to the lender. So you can agree that between yourselves, but then you just tell the tri-party provider. Tri-party provider takes that figure from you, they look at the collateral availability that the uh, borrower has, and then they allocate collateral to them. Now, some of it may be in their long box. So if you think on day zero, the borrower hasn't done any borrows, any loans, but they have a pool of available securities that they could use depending on the agent lender's criteria. <clears throat> so now they've done a loan, the agent lender says you need to get X amount Mr. or Miss or Mrs. Tri-Party Provider, you need to get that from the borrower. Now you have my schedule. So you go into that borrower's inventory and you take out securities that satisfy that, that requirement. And so that's particularly valuable, right? So the loan allocation, what happens? First of all, the agent lender doesn't have any settlements. 
they get advised electronically from the tri-party provider. You told us this figure. Here's the collateral that we've allocated to you. It satisfies your standards and requirements and criteria that you set up previously. From the borrower, they've agreed to provide that collateral. The borrower and the tri-party agent, what they agree is an optimization schedule where the borrower says, look, these are assets are really valuable to me because I can use them in multiple locations. Please use the collateral that I am able to use in the fewest possibles, possible places. Start with that, allocate that to the agent lender. As long as it's acceptable to them, it's win-win. It keeps my really valuable collateral elsewhere available for use but still satisfies the agent lender's requirements. So that is, oops, the other half of my slide is gone. It's gone. So in the replay, if I can put this in, I'll actually put this in because the real value of the tri-party provider, not just on the opening leg, if you think about the uh, replacements here, what happens now in the bilateral one, if there's a substitute in bilateral, the borrower has delivered those securities to the lender. Lender needs them back. Before the lender is going to give them back, they need to get other substitute securities in. So that's all the back and forth. Under, under the tri-party arrangement, of course, the reality is the value may or may not change if it has or hasn't changed. Effectively, the tri-party provider is going through a reallocation process and they say, okay, now intraday, the borrower uh, needs some securities back, so they need some of those assets back. So they're no longer available in the borrower's long box. And the tri-party provider just says, well, that's okay. Those securities aren't there. I'll take these securities instead and allocate them as long as they satisfy the agent lender's quality and diversification and concentration controls and they, they meet those needs. The agent lender really, all they're doing is receiving what the new allocation is because they'll probably want to do a check in terms of value sufficiency, uh, but also qualification criteria. I know I always have done a second check just because the tri-party agent says that it works for me. I still want to satisfy myself because my obligation as an agent lender is to my client. The tri-party provider has an obligation to me, but I have an obligation to my client. So I'm always going to do it double. So it's the replacement and the substitution and the movement and the settlement of those securities often can be done just by a reallocation because the borrower's long box typically will be held with the tri-party provider. And then only if the tri-party provider can't get securities that satisfy the agent lender's needs out of that long box, then the borrower will have to try and find securities elsewhere and deliver them to the tri-party provider. But the idea is to look at the borrower's long inventory and be able to allocate it effectively. And that's where the efficiency comes in. So if you want to do a comparison, and this uh, comparison table was put together by my friends at State Street. So thank you very much for that. And really just comparing the uh, the two features of trilateral versus bilateral. As far as the settlement, of course, on the opening leg, there is settlement activity. But remember, the settlement activity is really in tri-party between the borrower and the tri-party agent. Maybe it's an internal movement. That's the internalized settlement uh, comment there, because effectively nothing has to move at a local depository, for instance. It just gets allocated and reallocated and to move back and forth. So that's a big advantage. But in a bilateral transaction, the opening settlement leg, <clears throat> the bilateral receiver will have to do those settlements. Now, look, one of the one of the things that that I should say is that typically under securities lending collateral arrangements in tri-party, the borrower is the one that pays the fee. What you see sometimes is this combination between borrowers, a borrower and their lending counterparty, where a big chunk of it will be done in tri-party, but maybe some pieces of it will actually be done bilaterally. A good example of that might be government bonds, where maybe the equities and corporate bonds, if they take them, and some government bonds might actually be settled directly between, settled by a tri-party between the agent and the borrower. But then the borrower says, look, can I deliver these government bonds directly to you? 
because settlement costs are lower, custody costs are lower. It saves me, the borrower, from paying those fees. And it's a direct delivery to you of high quality assets. So you do see these kind of hybrid arrangements. It isn't necessarily a tri-party or always bilateral. Okay. The assets, of course, in either arrangement are segregated for the benefit of the agent lender as collateral in the event that they need to use them. Again, I'll say that the tri-party arrangements in the immediate default of Lehman Brothers, since the market had never experienced a disruption of such an enormous size. I don't think it was the smoothest thing in the world. I'll be honest with you. I think there was uh, some hesitation, some uncertainty, and some of the practice sessions that people had beforehand maybe didn't go as smoothly as we had all hoped. I also will say, I think that's all behind us because we've been through that. Again, the practice sessions, the, the business recovery operations, of firms that are dramatically different from where they were. And so I see that as a non-issue. I talked about the long box where again, it's easy for the borrower to move securities into the long box and out of the long box so that the tri-party agents can just go and take collateral that's appropriate to meet the needs of the borrow uh, of the agent lenders. So that's pretty effective. This collateral pre-selection, again, the borrower and lender agree and the borrower and lender agree on any limitations. So you don't need to check in a bilateral world. Again, you take German equities. Great. Here's some German equities. No, actually I'm topped up, right? The tri-party provider will know how much the agent lender is a willing to accept, but B how much they are holding. So then no one has to ask anyone, any questions on that. So this pre-selection process is really for me, one of the biggest uh, advantages of the business. Now, in theory, you could do in a bilateral world, everything a tri-party uh, provider does, but it would be ludicrously expensive, number one. Number two, you probably wouldn't do all the things that they do. And number three, it would just be a pain in the rump for your borrowing counterparties to go through all of that, all of that grief. Yeah, collateral pre-selection is, is great, but the collateral valuation is also an important part of that. So the, the member, the agent is delivering the value to the tri-party provider. The tri-party provider uses its pricing sources to value the securities that it allocates to, to the lender and then reprices them as well in, in you know, intraday. If the, you know, Asian securities being used this morning, everything else last, last, last night's close of business. So that valuation process is a huge burden, especially if you're running a really big book and you have lots of securities there. You as an agent lender or as a borrower might still run your own allocations or your own calculations on the value of the assets, but it's about the speed of implementation. Again, in a tri-party environment, uh, you can rely on the tri-party provider to do that. Whereas in a bilateral world, you are stuck. Your only option is to do it yourself. And then uh, you get into collateral disputes and how to collateral disputes. And then optimization, I think is from a borrower's point of view is certainly a critical point because as I said before, there are hierarchies of valuable collateral in terms of the liquidity, in terms of the number of counterparties that will accept it and the scope of the operation. So by developing an optimization process and methodology, the borrower can have confidence that they can kind of give their entire collateral pool there to the tri-party provider. And then the tri-party provider will follow that schedule. Let's say first allocate this, then allocate that. And then the final bit is the most valuable collateral, which they tried to preserve wherever possible. Now, Asher, who is watching from India has asked a question that collateral valuation has to be done under bilateral agreements as well for calculating exposures regularly. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and remember the tri-party provider, they're acting as an agent as well. So they, if you look in the contracts, everyone is acting as a service provider to everyone else. They don't guarantee that those are the right prices or that those will be the prices that will be available in the market for execution. So that's why, as I said, as whether I'm a borrower or a lender, I'm always going to want to be checking the collateral qualification. Does it meet my needs or the needs of my clients? Plus as well, figure out what, what I think the value is in case there's a dispute. There's no guarantee tri-party is always right. There's no guarantee my figures are right. You know, everyone suffers from stale prices or missing prices and the less liquid an asset is, 
the more you want to be uh, keeping an eye on it as collateral. So you're a hundred percent Asher. You need to, whether it's bilateral or triparty, I would argue, you need to be checking the valuations on the collateral so you can determine the appropriate exposures to your counterparties. But it's not an either or. I would say it's a. It's an. Just look. I'm really grateful that the to people at J.P. Morgan who who shared some of their internal observations or observations that they use with their clients. So here's a couple of extracts from a document that they gave me. Shows 6.15 trillion. I think this is from a. 2017 survey from the people at uh, Finadium. So Josh Galper and his team. Uh, so that's really helpful, but this gives you an idea of the scope. So this big green chunk of collateral and this 6.15 trillion is repo. Then you have securities lending as the next biggest piece. Then you have OTC derivatives, listed derivatives, and then rest of world really. You'll see that probably, I think in the current figures, I think the derivatives figures will grow in a current one, but it does give you an idea of the proportion. And I would also argue that probably this other activity is also. So anyway, look at it though. Repo is still the biggest market. Securities lending is still a very big market. The bottom ch uh, charts really show uh, a little bit of information about tri-party usage, the type of counterparty that's doing it. So broker, bank, non-bank institution or, or other service provider. Again, often this will be done on behalf of a non-bank financial institution as a client. So there's a little bit of overlap there. In terms of why people use, it's split kind of 50-50 in terms of accessing counterparties and mobilizing collateral. The accessing one in this one, because repo is such a, a dominant part of the collateral pool, the reality is some people will only uh, do repo through tri-party because of the allocation and the efficiency and to end the manager. It is going to be skewed. That's what they mean by access to counterparties. If you're going to trade with me, you have to use tri-party because otherwise the cost dynamics of moving securities back and forth are just too much. But of course, mobilizing collateral is again, finding a widest range of counterparties that you can actually deal with and allocate your collateral to. So if I'm not worried about having to find out individual capabilities and capacities on any given day, the tri-party provider can canvas my whole network on a daily basis to see what we can, what, what they can allocate to them based on our exposures. And as far as the users of it, you have half the market is roughly is, could either be a collateral provider or receiver. You'd expect that with banks who could be either way in a transaction. Whereas you find some who are only deliverers of collateral. And again, that world will have increased as a result of the uncleared margin regulations where more smaller uh, firms with derivatives exposures ha are now captured and they have to provide that. So I think there may be many that, that will actually be inflating these figures that I was talking about up here, which said is why I think the derivatives market exposure to be bigger, but then collateral receivers would be an agent lender or just an institutional lender that does their own activity where they're only ever going to be receiving collateral and never delivering it. We've got another question from Sudikar. Hopefully I pronounced that. What is the current mechanism for dealing with the unused collateral in the tri-party long box? Look, it's really the borrower owns that collateral. So it's a great question. And really what they're trying to do is they have their own needs, right? They'll have multiple internal desks that'll be buying and selling securities. They have customers that'll be doing it. Ideally, what they would be doing as well is they're going to be looking for their own customers short positions. And rather than borrow them, if they have them in the long box or as unused security somewhere, they'll try to be using those securities rather than borrowing them elsewhere, because that's the most efficient use of the asset. So the borrowers themselves are running their own optimizations and really anything that they don't need then becomes available for the long box. But look, it's up to them. They can pull securities back and forth subject to cutoff times. And really the collateral teams at the borrowers really are the managers of that long box position because those assets belong to them. And different banks and broker dealers have different organizational structures. Some still operate in silo basis. So the repo people will be different to the securities lending people, which will be different to the uh, derivatives people. And then you'll have the structured transactions will have, which will manage your own collateral pools. Or you'll find in some places where it's more horizontal, where one unit will manage all of the firm's collateral exposures. To me, 
that's the most efficient methodology. But uh, the reality is it's more than just which is most efficient. Sometimes it's structural, sometimes it's bonus related, but, uh, but that's an entirely another story, but I'm not certain it's another. Sudhakar, I, I hope that answered your question. If not, when I posted the video in YouTube, if you have other follow-up questions, uh, feel free to uh, post them there. And let me just flash up that video channel again. Here it is. That's a video channel, so this should be posted later today. And if you have questions, please pop them in there. And this is exactly the kind of thing that that I I, I can see becoming part of the community channel and exchange. Right? Just an opportunity to ask questions there. Okay. So those are observations. And then look, I've been asked about the outlook for war securities lending. Hold on a sec. Oh man, I have this great, I have this great video behind. Here it is. <laughs> I really like this video. So my outlook is that collateral values will continue to grow without a doubt. More and more businesses, more products, more exposures are being now being managed by collateral, right? I think it's really cost and capital inefficient not to collateralize your exposures. And that's the world that we're in and continuing to move to. Derivatives collateral will just continue to grow. I'm interested in seeing the, the latest statistics, but that's a big universe that will continue to get bigger. Triparty, it's dominating today. It will continue to dominate. Operationally, it is just too efficient and a good risk management tool to not really use it wherever possible. But look, where I see bilateral collateral having an even bigger role in future. So it's not just going to dwindle away to nothing because the challenge, while triparty is great for standard liquid asset classes, banks and, and other market participants will want to continue to finance as many assets as they possibly can. And that means that not all assets are going to be available for the widest pool. So every counterparty will increasingly hunt down less liquid assets, find counterparties that will accept those collaterals, maybe for specific transactions, maybe just generally. But look, the, the, the hunt for financing less liquid assets will almost certainly continue to be a bilateral world and be incredibly valuable to participants that make the effort on the bilateral side. So again, going back to Asher's, Asher's question before, this is part of the reason why you need to always be able to do bilateral business because you never know when an obligation is going to come, come up where you're going to need to manage and monitor an illiquid piece of collateral or less liquid where you can't really uh, count on an operational infrastructure from a tri-party provider and you have to be able to do it and of course, as new markets come on board, almost certainly what happens with a new market is that it starts off as a bilateral world. New market participants aren't just going to say, okay, we're going to do our first stock loan. We're going to go straight into tri-party. I'm sure it happens, but it isn't commonplace. So a new market will almost certainly always start with bilateral. And then when there's sufficient scale effort, and of course, legal opinions that and, and tax opinions that allow it to operate correctly in a given market because there's a lot of there's a lot of legal issue that goes behind collateral of any kind and that has to satisfy itself and new markets that's always one of the challenges or one of the tests before you go into the market how does it oper operate in terms of not just operating environment structurally but the whether there's a netting opinion there what happens in the event of insolvency and and really protecting the collateral receiver and givers. It, this isn't an either or world. It's a world of both. Okay. So let's just summarize it. The background is the world was paper-based. It was inefficient, it certainly wasn't scalable. There is no way we could manage collateral as effectively today if we still were burdened with the infrastructure from the past. Uh, and really the flows, if you look at it, it's about automation to me versus bespoke goals for the bilateral counterparties. All right. 
there's still value in bilateral. Again, people that are willing to finance less liquid assets will always get value. And by doing that extra work for the bilateral, they'll be compensated if, for it. And that's really what the business is. And as I said, this isn't really, if you want to compare them, there's pros and cons to, uh, to both, depending on where you where you are in the market. But I still would say this is a combination rather than either or the observations, growth in markets, growth in users, growth in structured trades, digital assets. If you look at markets, you will have seen the collateral used in Asian markets will have grown pretty dramatically last year. So that's a great example where you have markets where people are operating, but they found ways to mobilize assets more effectively and that increases the needs. So there's a lot still to happen. And of course, digital assets, whether they're immobilized and it's just about reallocating assets or, or you actually moving them in a digital space. So are you really moving them? That, that's another question, but look, digital assets, a whole brand new thing they're, The markets still are really tiny in digital, but growing and potentially growing uh, pretty dramatically. And then of course the outlaw, the outlook, the, the world is the financial world, at least is a collateralized and so tri-party and bilateral will continue to become even more important than they were in the past. I remember in my first year in doing securities lending in London in 1987, 1988, we didn't even use collateral. So think of that. Okay. So that's been it next week. We are going to be looking at ways in which market participants can find ways to increase income for their lending clients. So that's it for me. I hope this was useful to you. I'm going to race now and try to edit this and have it ready uh, in an hour and a bit. That will be a challenge, but uh, I'm up for the challenge. Then I'm going to get to the gym because I'm going to have a great Sunday. I got American football to end the week because we're in the playoffs. So I'm going to have a great Sunday. I hope you do. I hope you have a great week. Hope you'll be back next week. And thanks for being with me today.